Revolution up to 1961. Up to 1961. Now, you may wonder whether this 1961 has a secret meaning. It has a meaning, but this is not secret. Um, at this time, there were papers by Shiyama and Kippel, which established the framework for gravitational gauge theories once and forever, I think. <coughs> and this is a sort of a, water, uh, uh, a watershed between the development, where a lot of geometry and physics was brought in, and finally a breakthrough uh, 1961. And I want to recount uh, this rise of gauge theories of gravitation up to 61 in a, in a short version. So in chapter 1, <coughs> I should say that, of course, you can always ask questions in between. I was asked by somebody whether I would distribute exercises or something. Now, Professor Gain told me most students have so many duties that they would hardly uh, available for making exercises. But if, if some of you want some exercises, they can just signal to me and I will write uh, some uh, problems which you can solve, reading problems or uh, simple computations. It is very important and uh, if I look at some new papers on also on H theories of gravity, that people are sometimes not very f uh, familiar with the formalism. So there is on the one hand side in Einstein's theory tensor calculus, in the gauge theories is also exterior calculus. At least one of the formalisms you should have command of or should learn. And this cannot and this is partly underdeveloped because the formalism is an important tool for bringing our thoughts into a, a correct a coherent framework. So chapter one from special to general relativity. As I said, it's quasi-historical, um, special to general relativity, quasi-historical general relativity, because usually I can only drop some names, and this is of course not what a historian would do. Um, and I don't mention a lot of names which perhaps uh, should also be mentioned. But I want to give you always a certain uh, temporal framework. Special relativity was developed in uh, 1905, mainly by Lorenz, Poincaré, and Einstein. And general relativity was developed in 1950, mainly by Einstein, but this important contribution by Hilbert. And so this is for the special and special relativity. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, and this is what uh, is that um, one had a problem. When Maxwell's theory was discovered, Maxwell's equation uh, were formulated in 1863. <coughs> Maxwell 
had, had uh, difficulties uh, convincing his uh, contemporaries of his theory. Um, and and uh, the experimental breakthrough made it uh, all. And then, of course, we had classical mechanics. And classical mechanics, um, well, one often says non-relativist and Newtonian mechanics, which, is, which also has a Newtonian mechanics, mm -hmm. uh, which, well, is just in order to give it up. 1687 is, is when Newton uh, published his Principia. Um, and um, they, there was a clash. If one introduced massive bodies in Maxwell's theory and uh, looked in the motion of these bodies and rescribed the, uh, the, uh, the um, laws of classical mechanics, then this was a disaster. It didn't uh, lead to a correct theory. So, uh, and so that explains the title of Einstein's paper of 1905 on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. The vacuum field of Maxwell's theory was okay and proven by the experiments of Hertz and others, but the motion, as soon as you put these bodies, I mean, the, the Hertz was, was taking place basically and the wave was already absorbed from the source and in, in, in vacuum, and, and this proved Maxwell's vacuum equations. But um, uh, the, um, the material bodies which moved and which were charged or uncharged, this was a problem which could not be solved uh, with, with classical mechanics. So Einstein uh, uh, formulated two principles, the uh, special relativity principle, the, uh, equivalence of all inertial frames for uh, mechanics and uh, all effects in nature. And the second principle was this uh, principle of the constancy of light. And these two principles um, then led to uh, special relativity. <clears throat> okay, and special relativity was formulated in 1905, but then Minkowski in a paper, uh, 1908, incidentally he was one of the teachers and of Einstein and always thought that Einstein was not very well uh, verified. And when Minkowski uh, published his paper, uh, he said something like, uh, Einstein said something like, now uh, our good physics has fallen in the hand of mathematics mathematicians and nobody understands it anymore, you know, but, but later, two or three years later, he revoked this statement because he discovered that only by using the methods of Minkowski he could formulate gravitational theory successfully. So the four-dimensional version, I'm sorry to say, when I talk about four dimensions here, you know, <laughs> the four-dimensional version was decisive for Building up general relativity, which you could, of course, also show knows very well. But, but I mean, uh, uh, if you bring in random field theoretical conceptions, then the picture may change. I mean, that is what have we, we have heard in this conference in the last weekend. So Minkowski formulated uh, geometrical uh, space time, the Minkowski space time. So in uh, section, what is it called? Um, one one. <clears throat> one one is called uh, Minkowski, just Minkowski space. Minkowski space. There are books in, in, in libraries which are called Minkowski space, and they start with a sentence like Minkowski space is the space of special relativity and it's a vector space. And already that statement is wrong, because Minkowski space is not a vector space. Because each vector space has a preferred uh, a point, the origin. And of course, the idea of a Minkowski space is it's a flat Euclidean four-dimensional space with a pseudo-Euclidean metric. So it's, it's not an, um, a vector space. It's rather an affine space. Yes. Yeah. Minkowski space M. Is a, is a flat 
affine space. Flat affine space. So we have a Minkowski space. Uh, you have a lot of events. E, the set of all events. One event may be called P, and the other may be called Q. P and Q, etc. And in uh, such a, uh, and we, we can conceive a vector space which is attached to each event. This is the, then the vector space, but this is sort of the zero vector space, the zero vector space, the zero vector space. But these vector spaces are connected, or these events are connected by a translation. And this is a decisive notion. Often when people talk about gauge theories of gravity, they say, well, it must be the Lorentz group because that's a group of relativity. Uh, but this is not true, of course. The group of relativity is the inhomogeneous Lorentz group, the Perkari group. And, 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 uh, the, one of the, and if we had no translations, we had no energy momentum. And, and, and Lorentz transformations relate to angular momentum and not to energy momentum. So obviously, translations and rotations belong together. They are called Euclidean motions. So um, you have, if you make uh, an axiomatic of such a, uh, an affine space, then you have uh, to be sure that um, um, you fulfill certain axioms which are not going to spell out in great detail. So you have, for instance, uh, the event P, O plus, this is not an ordinary plus, um, V, which is a vector, which I call V, this vector space has vectors, small v, small w, etc. plus a vector is equal to q. Please be careful. This is an event, and this is an event. But this is a vector defined in this vector space. So this is a, a fundamental structure. And and now you have to formulate, and you have, of course, for each uh, event, you have coordinates, an event. You have coordinates, x0, time coordinate, x1, x2, and x3, or for short, x i, where i runs from zero. And this translation is what mathematicians call a free transitive operation. Sensitive operation. I, I would like to refer to the book of Snapper. Snapper and Troyer. And it's simply called metric affine geometry. Geometry. Um, I even have the number at 1971. In New York, 1971. space is, is first, <coughs> that uh, we have, it, it, it's so-called simply transitive, transitive, if we, um, if we have a, let me make a sketch, if we have an event P, and if we have two vectors, two translations, here a translation V and here a translation W, and if, then we can, on the one hand side, take the event and execute a translation, which is just the vector, uh, sum of the two vectors, 
which, which is of course in a vector space well defined, and then we come here to an event R. So P O plus, and this is now a vector plus, this is an ordinary plus in vector calculus plus W, and this gives us um, the event R, but on the other hand side, we should be able first to execute the V, we have here our event P and go here with the translation to this point and then we take a second translation W which is now not very parallel and we come to the same point. So that must be let P plus O plus V O plus W results in the same. We have to establish this as an axiom such that this takes the case because that's what we what happens in a Euclidean space. And the, the second main axiom which one has to do is that um, um, the vector between uh, two domains is uniquely is only uh, is uniquely defined. So uh, that uh, uh, if you have a Then you can reach it from the event P by a unique vector, namely just the difference between Q and uh, P. Translation Q minus P. And this property is you have to, um, uh, to, to go come into your axiomatics. So um, this is to show that uh, in, an, in an affine space, uh, translation is a, is a fundamental concept. Translation is a fundamental concept. Often forgotten in the literature. I saw reason in the book by Borges shortly before he died. He's a very famous quantum field theoretician. Most of the stuff he writes, I don't even understand. Uh, he wrote uh, this last book on the meaning of translation in quantum field theory. I mean, so for somebody who uh, uh, would like to see that from a more elevated point of view, uh, uh, the meaning of translations may turn to this. Um, so, so far we have then an event space, space of events. We have a translation and we have a vector space. But this is not yet a Minkowski space. A Minkowski space, additionally, M, additionally, requires, requires a metric, requires, well, a tool for measuring angles, measuring angles and distances. And that's a metric. And since we have what I forgot to say, our <laughs> coordinates are in rectilinear coordinate systems. So these coordinates which I denoted here are with respect to a rectilinear coordinate system. In affine space, there are so far no orthogonality, which only comes in through the metric, so it's rectilinear coordinate system. <clears throat> um, we need a metric, and this, uh, uh, and we need a pseudo Euclidean uh, pseudo Euclidean metric. Or with pseudo, no, I shouldn't say pseudo Euclidean metric. Uh, we need what what the mathematicians nowadays call the Lorentz metric. Even so, it was invented by Minkowski. We need a Lorentz metric, which has a pseudo, uh, a pseudo Euclidean signature, that is plus, minus, 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 <coughs> or the other way around. <coughs> okay, so if you have a metric and you feed into vectors, G, parenthesis, V, 
comma W parentheses uh, defined G I J times V I times W J summation in time of course. And if you write it in longhand, it's because it's a D zero, D W zero minus So that is our metric.